Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing okay. Um, this is my last recording um, before Christmas, although you will have input from other colleagues. So um, I hope that you all have uh, the Christmas holiday firmly on your horizon. So the subject of this lecture today is to talk about community consultation and engagement as part of our studies in sustainable regeneration practice. Now in the essay, you will have already begun to pick up on some elements of community consultation, the importance of having community involvement um, when we are trying to generate um, social sustainability. Um, but what I want to talk about in this lecture is more of the kind of principles behind community engagement and community consultation. And then to end with some of the techniques that you can use for engaging communities, some very practical things. And for the seminar, I would like you to think about um, how do we engage communities in this era of COVID-19? How do we replicate that um, human experience of sharing the same space as someone and being in the same room as someone, making someone a cup of tea to try and help them to feel at ease or maybe sharing some food or these very human things and very um, tactile things that in this era of um, virtuality are nigh on impossible to replicate. But there are ideas that we could begin to discuss and that's what we'll be doing in the seminars. So what I want to think about is um, the importance of community uh, consultation. Um, and yeah, this will maybe just help to just give a little bit of animation to your essay, not really in terms of content, but more in terms of understanding that sort of notion of, you know, why is community engagement important in um, sustainable regeneration practice? And then to talk about the nature of community engagement in managing environments, of, of all sorts, whether they be neighborhoods, whether they be you know towns, whether they be cities. So um, community engagement is a very versatile instrument, a very versatile tool. And then yes, we want to think about how do we replicate um, meaningful community engagement in an era of COVID-19, bearing in mind that there's a distinct possibility that we'll be in this particular, um, um, era for quite some time. I'm recording this on Thursday, the 26th of November, and um, you know, lockdown measures have become even more stringent as we've discovered today. Um, so, you know, let's you know think about how we can continue meaningful community engagement despite lockdown. I love this quote from Albert Einstein: "We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them." So sometimes, you know. Um, Sometimes the old methods are not necessarily the best methods, and sometimes we've got to reframe old problems, but in new ways. And I think in many ways, although it's immensely challenging, of course, COVID-19 has forced us to rethink the way that we engage communities, engage with communities. And we make sure that we do that equitably and democratically. And one thing it's worth saying is that with community engagement, you must always go in with an open mind and with a positive disposition. You must always be prepared to let go of whatever sort of um, sense of identity you have of yourself as being the professional and certainly we you know no one ever has all the answers and i've been astonished um, by how often communities when given the chance present the answers to me or to other people who are working with them so you've got to be prepared to give people the space to come up with their own ideas and part of that means letting go of the power or any perception of power that you feel that you may have as the so-called professional person. Do it properly and give communities the chance to have their say whilst managing expectations as you go along. And I'll be coming back to that point. So when we're thinking about um, community engagement, our starting premise should really be what can each individual bring to the table? Um, what are their special sort of attributes? What um, themes may they be strong on? Um, what might they be able to contribute um, um, with? Um, at the same time, thinking more broadly that a proper community engagement is about embracing um, a diverse set of views. So sometimes, you know, we need to be a little bit skeptical of people not grafting their own um, personal agenda onto an issue that may not necessarily be important for the rest of the community, it may be important for them, but may not necessarily be important for the rest of the community. So in an ideal world, you know, we're looking at communities sort of bottom up, 
um, driving the process rather than being top down um, with government decreeing what should happen. Um, there has been an increase in top down sort of government control policy making processes in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, but communities don't like to be told how to do things. What they like to be uh, invited to is to have the chance to have their input and to know that the voices are being listened to. And I mean, really listened to properly, listening intelligently and, you know, kind of, you know, sifting through where the uh, priorities are, what people are saying, and also having an awareness for how to reach voices, hidden voices, people whose voices are not often heard. Um, with the most deprived communities, often people are dealing with multiple disadvantage. So a particular effort has got to be made to ensure that those voices don't get lost in the mix. And certainly it's not the case that, you know, he who shouts loudest gets heard. Um, so if we enable communities to drive the process, that will help us to tackle concerns, identify opportunities, and to develop potential areas of development. Um, you know, what things have we not thought of? And these are all very, a very rewarding and a very important part of community engagement. Community itself is a notoriously slippery concept. It has many different connotations. Um, Cochrane describes it as, um, it may be conceived as groups of people defined by geography, so spatially, or identity or interest, or even viewed as an aspirational model, i.e. I would like to be a member of that community. Um, and involvement can be taken to mean many different forms of interaction and participation. Um, that can be active participation. Sometimes people participate by um, sometimes uh, maybe not necessarily contributing much orally. Uh, and sometimes people make their voices heard by not contributing at all. So we've got to be aware of that aspect of community engagement also that just um, that the, you know, the, the, the act of saying something or completing the questionnaire or whatever it might be, got to be aware of the people whose voices are silent and be a little bit quizzical as to why that, may, that might be the case. It may be an act of resistance or it may be that they feel that their voices won't count. When we think about um, people power and regeneration, I do like this acronym ABCD. It's very easy to wrap your head around. I've added the E at the end so that so we can focus on equality, everyone being included, equity. But, you know, people are assets. You know, citizens can change things. Community as place driven by relationships. And there's a lot of um, reference in the literature on the importance of social networks and social in interrelationships in terms of creating opportunities for communities to thrive. And that links to the literature on um, sustainable regeneration practice in relation to the social, but it also links to more sort of abstract philosophical debates around the notion of social capital, um, which I will be giving a lecture on later on in, the, uh, in um, semester two. So, but just to flag social capital, which is just as important as economic capital, and um, social capital can take different forms and certainly people power is one of those forms where normally those relationships are used to make a positive difference. But going back to what we think a community is, uh, a community can be a place, a shared locality, a physical entity, you know, um, it could be a neighborhood that has a definable spatial boundary. But we also can talk about communities of interest, people who coalesce together around common interests and common goals. Um, that could be around, you know, faith, based groups or, you know, occupation or ethnicity or socio-cultural identity, or it could be around, you know, hobbies, it could be around music. You know, we have certain communities that coalesce because we have this, 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 this common force that kind of forges our relationships. Community of, of meaning. So these are the meanings that we assign to particular places. You know, it could be because of um, a particular dominance of a certain culture. It could be because these places mean something to us. We are a community of people who perhaps maybe um, have visited Ground Zero, for example. And we could be, we are certainly united at Sheffield Hallam because we are a community that for whom the university is meaningful. So I think there's different ways that we can, we can frame community and that's really important to note. Community engagement is um, 
takes that one step further because community engagement talks about people being proactive, being sort of actors in their own destiny to try and change things. Um, at the bottom of that slide, you'll see I've made a note that often uh, misguidedly, community engagement and community involvement are used interchangeably in the literature as though they were the same thing. Well, well they're not the same thing. Um, community involvement is a lot more passive. You can be involved in something, you can be part of the process, but engagement is where you're proactively trying to change things and you're trying to shift things. So community engagement, um, as Rogers and Robertson noted, encompasses a variety of approaches whereby public service bodies empower citizens to consider and express their views on how particular needs are best met. So the word empowerment is the one that really rises to the fore here, isn't it? You know, empower people. And if we're to empower people properly, we need to let go of whatever power we have, whether it's great or whether it's modest, and we need to be able to resource what communities need, you know, give money, training and support to enable people to really, really shape things. If you're really capacity building, the term in the literature is community capacity building, you're upskilling people so that they can actually, you know, take charge of things on their own without the need to have uh, additional input. And that's the, uh, the, I guess that's really the utopian model, although it's not without its flaws as we'll be coming on to in a moment. Um, so community empowerment and community engagement, very important concepts in sustainable regeneration practice. Um, you know, this will involve partnership working, it will involve negotiation, it will involve often compromise. When we're engaging people, we want to enter into a dialogue, we're listening, we're exchanging views, and I think real dialogue, as the Polish sociologist um, um, Sigmund um, Bowman said, excuse me, that real, real dialogue happens when people of opposing views come together. We have, you know, two people who are sort of, you know, opposing views, uh, maybe even in conflict, but if we can get those people sitting around the table and beginning to talk, then that makes a really big difference. So is that the community, um, the community view, which is proffered, is one which is representative and one where, you know, other views have been, um, have been listened to and acted upon. So I'm just going to pause the lecture at this point and I'd just like you to do a little exercise. So I would like you to think of words and phrases that evolve, evoke the um, word community to you. When you think of it, what do you think about? And then have a think about what sorts of communities you know yourself. I mentioned we are a, a community of academics and students at the, uh, the university and I see that as a continuum, it works in a, in a cycle. And then to begin to list some of the benefits of community engagement, why is it that that is important? And what methods might you use to conduct community engagement given the COVID-19 pandemic? And that final point about in, uh, engagement um, given COVID-19 is what we'll be discussing during our seminars, okay? So think of um, phrases that you evoke the word community. What, do you, what comes to mind when you think of community? What sorts of communities have you identified? And this some of the benefits of community engagement. And finally, what methods you might use um, to overcome the uh, limitations of COVID-19. So I'm just going to pause the recording. Okay, so I hope you've been able to make some notes based on those four key themes, and we will be coming back to these during the course of the seminar. Rogers and Robertson have identified three processes of community engagement, which I think are really, really helpful. Socialization, the processes by which communities encourage the internalization of cooperative sociable standards. So that's to say that that becomes the default way of uh, interacting. Guardianship, the way that people keep an eye out for each other, um, that can really help with sort of instilling trust. You know, if um, something wrong with, I don't know, you've left your front door open accidentally or you've forgotten your key or you're away on holiday and you want someone to take, keep an eye on your, on your home for you or to feed the cat. You know, um, these, these, these things are indicators of degrees of community engagement. Information flows. This is when, you know, the process by which communities work with public bodies, you know, um, to um, providing them with information about the way that things work. So actually telling public bodies, you know, what works best for them and making sure that that information flows in a 
regular and, and, and fluent way. Jerry Einstein famously um, came up with this ladder of citizen participation where she outlined degrees of involvement. Now this does go back way back to 1969, but it is still really valid today um, because Sherry Einstein's um, seminal model as depicted here has been taken and sort of interrogated many, many times and replicated and deconstructed and reconstructed by many different authors since. But this is a copy of the original ladder of citizen um, participation degrees of involvement. As you can see, there are eight rungs on the ladder. Um, manipulation is where people, certainly there's no degree of engagement or involvement even. This is where people are told things at probably a, a most likely as a form of political manipulation. Therapy is where people are sort of given information, but just sort of drip fed it strategically so as that they feel as though they're being told something, but they're actually not being really told anything. Informing people is where you present things as a fait accompli. This is, you know, this is this is what's been done. This is what I'm, into, you know, there's no room for consultation. But the next wrong, wrong four is consultation. We're offering this up for consultation. Um, this is what we are thinking. What do you think? Sometimes it's difficult to see whether this is proper consultation um, or whether some decisions have already been made behind closed doors. That is um, far too common, unfortunately. Um, partnership is, you know, when, sorry, placation is where maybe people are placated, their, their fears are, um, the fears are addressed, they're reassured. Partnership working is where different organizations come together. And that's where we're, <coughs> excuse me, really beginning to see degrees of devolvement. Delegated power is where power is um, delegated from, you know, whoever is the, 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 the holder of that power and given to communities or different groups within that community. Although I must point out at this juncture that power is no good. Uh, you know, you, you can only hand over your power to someone who wants to take it from you. So um, that's the point to bear in mind. And that receiver of power must be able to do something properly with it. So there are issues in terms of are people, do people have the right skills to enable them to act on that power? And ultimately, according to Einstein, is this notion of citizen control, which really puts citizens at the very top of the tree, being totally in charge of their own destinies um, and outcomes for communities. However, you know, we need to be a little bit cautious here because that ultimate kind of sort of um, free license to have total control may not always be desirable. I mean, it might well be just to protect people against themselves that there will always be a need for a benevolent state to intervene and to offer counsel and to prevent, you know, um, uh, things happening such as, you know, um, sustainable practices not being observed. That's a really important case, case in point. The New Economics Foundation have varied Einstein's ladder um, and they have this sort of three-way um, split of, as you can see on the right-hand side of the diagram, doing two, this is things being done to communities, doing four, things being done for communities, or doing with. So doing with communities, so that's kind of partnership working. And it's that co-production and co-designing and co-creation, which is something which is part of that ultimate goal to sort of citizen control or at least a devolution of power with adequate resources. But in reality, you know, we can talk about ladders and we can talk about pyramids and all the rest of it. But in fact, you know, community engagement is a continuum, you know, that there, there is a virtuous circle to be, um, to, be, to be harnessed by investing in the social, the economic, um, the environmental and in the physical, you know, so as that we have this sort of circular approach to um, sustainability that doesn't just depend on one thing. And it's certainly not a linear process. You know, it's all about capacity building and empowering people, but that's got to be something which is kind of built in and becomes institutional sort of cultural change rather than it being sort of piecemeal or, or just at a particular snapshot in time. And um, Gavenda's power cube, just like a Rubik's cube, if anyone's got a Rubik's cube, this will be familiar to you, I think is also a really handy device for us to conceptualize degrees of community involvement and this all important notion of power. The power cube, you know, talks about levels, spaces and forms of power. 
So as you can see on the left hand side, the you know you know the the the, the power that's held by global, national, and local um, organizations, and that link between the local and the global and globalization, of course. And then we have the way that you know um, spaces may be closed, or people may be invited in, or they may be claimed, or they may be reclaimed. People may be you know evicted from them. That's very important too. And then we have the different forms of power, you know, visible, um, hidden and invisible, you know, these different power structures that work, some are transparent and some aren't. And I think we, we, have, we need to maintain a keen interest in both. And it's when, we, if, it's when we sort of adjust the Rubik's cube, if we follow Gaventa's model, that we can see where the complexities of, of power lie. And the fact that there may well be shifts in terms of key stakeholders, as um, things evolve over time, over space, space and time. So if we use community engagement properly, some typical positive outcomes are that things are better managed. People's quality of life increases, life opportunities become enhanced. And <clears throat> also people are able to learn new skills. If we're really sort of devolving power properly to people and we want people to take ownership of things, they've got to have the skills to see that through. So people can learn through, you know, things like, you know, how to um, learn the skills of project management, how to analyze data from questionnaires and, and so on. So, um, so a positive culture is generally one that has a very, a very meaningful impact on where people live and how, and how they live. When we talk about stakeholders, what we really mean is people who have a vested interest in the outcome of something. So in community consultation, it's really important to identify who the key stakeholders are, the community themselves, um, the leaders, you know, community leaders, potential partners, the political leaders, that's also very important. Uh, and then we think about providing information and training to help to support those, those leaders. <coughs> Excuse me, and then our next phase might be to enable, to facilitate a consultation process. When we know what the outcome of that is, then we think about relinquishing control um, and moving on to this all important way of capacity building, enabling people to meaningfully take control of things so as that they are able to, um, you know, uh, decide things on their own without having to have the input from, you know, a so-called professional um, and that those, those, you know, newly formed and um, capable, more capable communities um, are able to determine their own destinies and they have a, an inbuilt um, self-sustaining component. But do watch out, this is a, a red flag that, you know, not that all the dominant voices are not the ones that always get heard. You've got to, and in the same way that a lighthouse spreads its beam across somewhere as a community leader with an interest in community engagement, that's what you have to do. Um, and I've got numerous examples of things that I've been involved with over the years. In fact, a, a, a very recent project, which I will tell you about when I see you in the seminars, that um, is, will offer you insights into the perils and the positives of community engagement um, on a specific project that I've been um, uh, working on with members of uh, my local community here, but more on that later. So here are some of the benefits of community engagement. I won't run through all of these, but just to flag up things like it does increase public trust. And this is really important at a time when actually people's view of, of central government and local government to a lesser degree, but still is, um, is uh, local government and central government do not score highly on um, public surveys of trust. The other, I mean, there's numerous examples, but an another one just to, just to pick up on, is you know increasing a sense of togetherness helps you know social cohesion and that's always good from all kinds of points of view and of course there are opportunities for people to learn new skills and um, so a few more there which i'll leave you to read in your own time um you know there's exercises you can do that are generational that might help to address inequities further down the line for future generations um, it brings people together who have different backgrounds, but they'll be pursuing a common goal. And that's all good for um, equality and um, um, uh, citizen engagement. So I want us now to begin to think about 
consultation techniques. Because we're in, you know, before COVID, community consultation, when I look back at it, it used to be relatively straightforward. We would go to where the communities are, we would um, talk to people, we would maybe set up meetings, focus groups, we would hand out questionnaires, we would take snapshot surveys. Sometimes, you know, I've done work where I've got people around a table with, you know, um, with bits of paper and post-its and photographs and things, got people to draw things, you know, what do you want your community to be like? Where do you want this to be? Where, where, where might green space be best, be best um, um, located and so on. So things like public displays are really good to engage people. Um, and um, I've done a few of those over the years. Um, but I think um, one of the very simple ways to talk to people properly is to just sit down with them with um, a cup of tea and have a chat. Um, maybe share some lunch, maybe have some food on the go. Um, and in these, this day of COVID, of course, we can't, we can't do that. We can't bring people into us. We've got to be reliant on um, the virtual world and um, things like Zoom and, you know, Skype and FaceTime online questionnaires and useful as they are, they don't quite in any way, in fact, go any way to replicate the power of the cup of tea and the human touch. So what I want you to think about during the seminars, please, is um, how do we replicate um, methods um, that are effective during COVID-19? How can we try and duplicate that direct human face-to-face -face contact whilst we're all in our in our bubbles? You know, how can we do that? Can you think of any way where we could duplicate the nice reassuring cup of tea kind of approach? Could you think of any way where we could maybe just get people around to have a lunch, even in their own homes? How can we use things like food and general, you know, hot drinks and things like that to bring people together? Um, and what other techniques might be used in this era of COVID to try and encourage more um, community consultation? So that's, I think that's a really in interesting challenge, everyone, and do, you know, do get thinking and see what ideas you can come up with. How do we replicate as far as we can that sort of human element and that human touch given, given COVID-19? So just some concluding reflections, you know, community engagement is an integral skill for us to learn in managing environments, in managing localities, in managing neighbourhoods. We need to temper our expectations to what can be achieved. We mustn't over-promise and under-deliver. If anything, we under-promise and over-deliver. Um, monitor feedback that you get from communities. Make sure that you listen and if you can, act on what people have said. You know, everyone has something to bring to the table. Um, do celebrate success, but remember to be critical and reflective about how things may be improved upon too. So, you know, as ever, we are, we are never complacent. We're always trying to move forward with, you know, um, vim and vigor and, you know, proactively to see what we can do to make things um, even better next time round. So I hope that's been helpful, everyone. Just a little, a little um, quite uh, um, um, short insight into community engagement. But I hope it's given you something to think about. And um, I look forward to seeing you all next week in the seminars. So um, until then, have a really good weekend, a good few days and bye for now.